<laughs> Our speaker today is Brian Alcabello. Uh, Brian's a native of New Orleans, and he is a career history teacher, a high school history teacher, received his uh, undergraduate and graduate degree uh, from LSU. Uh, he worked with the State Department of Education on curriculum coordination, and he worked with a five-school charter system uh, on their curriculum uh, planning. Uh, he's published three books, the one you'll hear about today, Whiskey, Women, War, How the Great War is in World War I, Shaped the Jim Crow in New Orleans. His other two books, in the Shadows, Furious, uh, is a World War II setting in the uh, island of uh, New Georgia uh, in the uh, same area as Guadalcanal, that island group there. And also uh, New Orleans Goes to War, uh, which is another uh, World War II story about life in New Orleans. So uh, very interesting writer. He also uh, cruises uh, with the American Queen, on the Mississippi River and does historical lectures uh, while cruising from New Orleans to Memphis on that. So, very accomplished uh, individual. We're delighted to have Brian with us today. Thank you, Brian. Thank you <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, thanks for inviting me here and Drew is uh, uh, Bird as well. Uh, for your kind uh, and gracious welcome. I'm um, really happy to be here. Um, the book, sadly, is not about Bay St. Louis, so I want to get that out from the very beginning. However, it was published by the University of Mississippi Press. So there's one connection that I want to share with you, and I have others. Uh, you know, as a kid growing up, we often uh, took trips to Bay St. Louis and the Gulf Coast, like a lot of New Orleanians did. So I have fond memories of this area. It's such a beautiful, lovely town. So thank you for having me again, Chris. And it, I found out just by accident that Chris and Bert and myself all went to the same high school. Uh, and we were there at the same time, actually. Not in the same class, but uh, at the same time. So that was an amazing coincidence. So De La Salle High School in New Orleans. You too? <laughs> Who would have thought? Okay, so there is a, obviously a close connection between the city and, and Bay St. Louis. Uh, lots of, I think, uh, ex New Orleans expats li live here, I guess, some of which are here tonight, some of whom are here tonight. So anyway, um, I, I'm going to talk about uh, the city during the years of 1917 and 1918, the years of World War I. So the book is not about were the war. It's not a war book, but it, the war presents a framework uh, of events that took place in the city. And I, I uh, happened upon the, the materials by accident. And if you're interested in that, I can talk about that later. But, and I want to make sure that you know, this is not really a lecture in the term. In, I want it to be informal, please. I'm used to having people interrupt me with their hands up in the middle of a sentence. So if you have a question, Please, uh, I'm, I'm wel I welcome that. I'm real used to that. So <laughs> go right ahead and ask your question. So, uh, of course, President Wilson is here on your right, who was president during those years. And um, I have uh, the front page of the uh, New York uh, Evening Tribune here um, to indicate one of the pivotal moments in our history uh, uh, that helped to bring America into the war. So the war, just to quickly... Uh, remind you, the war started in 1914, ended in 1918. The United States, however, did not declare war until 1917. Uh, so in the years 1914 and 1917, really, a little bit before, uh, America was really on the fence. Uh, American people were on the fence about who to support. Um, 1915, however, this happens. This is a British passenger liner. But it had a lot, it was, it was sailing from New York to the UK. Lots of Americans were on board. Uh, and it was torpedoed by what we know now is a uh, German submarine. And 126 Americans were drowned or otherwise killed in that, in that event. And that began the slow change of American public opinion from 
the Germans and Austri uh, the uh, German and the uh, Austro-Hungarians toward the side of the British and the French. It was a slow but continual uh, a shift in American public opinion. This is what it, what, what it did. This did not trigger the beginning of our uh, entry into the war at all. This is 1915. We still have two more years. So in World War I, one of the interesting things about this war is that there was no Pearl Harbor. There was no immediate trigger. There was no uh, sinking of the USS Maine in uh, Havana Bay to start the Spanish-American War. There was nothing like that. Uh, there wasn't a, 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 you know, the bombardment of Fort Sumter. This was a, a two-year period where there was a lot of, uh, still a lot of people that were tentative about America's role in Europe at that time. So just keep that in mind. So one of the really interesting people that I, I came across, this was a New Orleanian by the name of Edgar Bullany, who came from a, a very upper-class Creole family. His parents uh, insisted that he speak French at home, so he was fluent in French, but he was a troubled young man. And I'm only going to briefly give you some highlights. There's, there's much more in the book. Uh, but Bullany uh, was always in trouble. He was sent away to boarding school. He escaped from boarding school, went up to, went, as a 16-year-old, went to St. Louis where he became a bellhop. You know, he was just a troubled kid, was involved in a shooting at the French Opera House. Uh, you know, a mess. Uh, anyway, so he ends up, the war begins, and he ends up joining the French Foreign Legion. He was old enough to join the French Foreign Legion. And it's there where he learned how to fly, and he became a part of the, the very famous Lafayette Escadrille. You know about that. Uh, and you can see him here. This is the symbol of the Lafayette Escadrille here, with that, that Indian chief head, head there on the side of the fuselage of the plane. So he became, he flew in the war, which was uh, wounded four different times, and became somewhat of a hero. He was awarded the Croix de Guerre by the French government after the war, very high honor. Um, but then, whoop, I don't want to go that far yet. So let me tell I don't want you to read that yet. So anyway, so um, he, the war's over. He's a big photographer. He goes to, he's, he took a lot of pictures from the cockpit of his plane during the war. And he goes to this uh, development uh, studio in Paris, and he meets this young French woman that he became infatuated with. And like three weeks later, they're married. Um, she can't speak any English. It doesn't matter. We're in love. Uh, and so, and so they, get, they get married um, in New Orleans. But on the, he flies back. Oh, he doesn't fly back. He takes the ship back to New Orleans, where his parents are still living on Bourbon Street, by the way in an apartment, and um, they get married there, and that very night, their wedding night, he says, you know, I forgot to tell you one thing about me that I had not revealed before. Uh, what is that, Edgar? Uh, I'm already married. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it just sort of slipped his mind uh, somehow. So um, anyway, so she says, that's okay, I love you, you know, we can just get a divorce. Anyway. So um, they plan on going around selling their photographs. Uh, they try different businesses, and it's a failure. Everything's a failure. And he starts to drink. And anyway, they, they, uh, and he starts hanging out at a place called the Tango Belt in New Orleans. Some of you might know what that is. Tango Belt is part of the Vieux Carré, kind of the Iberville, Bienville streets near Canal Street, which are just, just right next to Canal Street. Real seedy area. Uh, seedier than the rest of the Vieux-Carré, <laughs> um, with a lot of uh, bars and beach drinking and uh, uh, just places that you don't, you don't want your husband hanging out in, let's put it that way. Uh, so he comes back, he's inebriated a lot, and he begins to physically uh, abuse her, physically. And um, so one day he was really, he hit her and she had a gun hidden in the kitchen. She pulled it out and she shot him, killed him. And then she was sobbing over his body, you know, I love you, I love you, but she was defending herself. So all over the country, his, the, this event, the shooting, spread all over the country because, and I forgot to tell you this, he was the first American casualty of World War I. The first American to be shot in World War I, very first, so that helped to you know, inspire all of these uh, headlines. And this is, 
I mean, even tiny newspapers across the country had headlines. It was easy to find real good information because of uh, stories like this. So um, anyway, she was never arrested because she showed the police bruises on her body and they let her go. Um, anyway, she's eventually going to go back uh, home to France. But uh, he's buried in the Chalmette National Cemetery today. So there's a lot more about this guy, but I thought I'd share at least, at least a little bit with you. Um, one of the things that World War I did inspire was it helped to reinforce what we call the Great Migration. The Great Migration was this exodus of African Americans from the South, mostly during World War I, um, to find better jobs in industrial centers up north. So St. Louis and Chicago and Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, uh, all were beneficiaries of this flood of African Americans from the South, not just New Orleans. But you can see here, this map uh, shows you some of the, you know, this blue, the blue lines and the arrows where a lot of those folks uh, went to just for improving their lives. And because the, these industries were so desperate for workers that they even sent agents down to New Orleans. I don't know about other cities, but I know in New Orleans, it was agents paid for by these industries, these war industries, to uh, hand out free vouchers for families that wanted to leave New Orleans and go up north for a better job. They would pay their ways. A lot of these families couldn't afford the train fare for themselves and their families. So they would pay their way, even promising to find apartments for them to live in and pay like the first three months. It was a, a tremendous effort to pull these folks out. And it, so this was another reason for this great exodus during World War I. New Orleans, uh, uh, most, most of the people that left New Orleans were African Americans, not all, but many of them were, and they worked in farming areas throughout the, the state, uh, and the nor North Shore of New Orleans, particularly in the strawberry industry, suffered tremendously because they needed people. It, and uh, a lot of those, uh, those farms actually imported Cuban people to come to work in their office, in their, on their farms, because they needed people just like the industries in the North did. And so we had over 10,000 Cubans that we paid for to come here into uh, the New Orleans area to work. And you can see, you know, again, this is just one of the signs showing you how desperately they needed workers. And then there's a picture. Uh, Chicago, 65 to 109,000 people flooded the city, and so on and so forth. And here, here's a photo of them waiting at a train station. Now, one of the other reasons they left was not just because of better pay, although that was the number one reason, <coughs> but they also left because of the scourge of, of Jim Crow. And this, is a, this was taken from the Times-Picayune. I have the date here, 1918. Um, and it's just an ad. It's an ad from a clothing store, um, Mayor Israel. It was the name of the clothing store, and this was this was just commonplace. They would take a black dialect, put it in a newspaper ad like this, and it just shows you. I think it gives you an example of the way that African Americans in New Orleans and elsewhere were treated pretty badly, ridiculing them. They did join, in large numbers, the military. And when they did join, they joined, of course, they were segregated, just like it was in World War II, segregated in World War I. And when they joined up, they ended up, for the most part, being common laborers in labor units, where they would on and, uh, unload and load trucks and ships and stuff like that. Very, very few African Americans were actually in combat, none from Louisiana or none from New Orleans. Um, but one really positive thing that came out, out of this was that this is the beginning of jazz in, in the country, really. And, and, and of course, uh, New Orleans was one of those, those places that gave birth uh, to jazz. So we had several musicians from New Orleans that would join up and they would be placed in these military bands, like you see here in this photograph. But then after hours, they would go about the cities in nearby or towns nearby and they would play in jazz combos 
and they would play jazz for the first time for these French people, and they went wild about jazz. It, would, it really, really was the first time jazz was exported. It came about because of these mostly African-American soldiers who played uh, for them uh, in a, you know, after their time on, on duty. And I have a... Excuse me for uh, bowing over like this, but I have a little excerpt I thought you would enjoy. I'll read from the book. So jazz was controversial, as you might know. Not everybody thought it was a wonderful genre of music. Lots of people were worried about it for various reasons. They thought it was salacious, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I'm reminded of what happened when Elvis started. You all know that story, huh? You know, in the Ed, Ed Sullivan show, right? Waist up, that's it, right? No hips. Uh, but it's, it's so uh, reminiscent of that. So um, not every, let me just uh, pause for, to read this. Not everyone was as delighted uh, with jazz. Jazz was not unlike other new trends that defied convention and evoke ridicule. An editorial in, in the conservative Times-Picayune newspaper excoriated the new musical species, blasting it as, quote, a manifestation of a low streak in a man's taste that has not come out of in civilization's wash. That's right from an editorial there. In this house, it continued, jazz is, quote, down in the basement, a servant's hall of rhythm. The author could not understand how its cult, he called it a cult of acolytes, quote, love to fa fairly wallow in noise. <laughs> the New Orleans item, another one of the dailies in New Orleans, was no kinder. Quote, every musician must play out of tune. <laughs> they, are, they are seized, quote, seized by epileptic fits and perform like they are contortionists. Dan dancing to its rhythm sound, I'm sorry, dance, dancing to its random sound was the most troubling of all. Many older folks, black and white, looked on it as a menace, a symbol of unwanted change, a perversion of familiar, beloved tunes, which jazz musicians derisively labeled sweet music for dicty people, D-I-C-T-Y, which meant snobby, upper-class people. Um, uh, where is it? Well, I left my... Oh, uh, oh dicty folks with money. They especially feared the enchantment this dancing had for their children and its ability to overreach racial boundaries. That was big. Jazz was insolent. That was a large part of its appeal. Its revolutionary message crossed Jim Crow parameters, fascinating young and urbane whites to a musical species that evolved from the bowels of the African-American experience. And it was a participatory, not a passive allure. That was just unacceptable to some. Historian Jennifer Atkins defined the new dances that evolved from jazz even more broadly. Women were, quote, testing the limits of social acceptability through their bodies as it brought couples together in sexually explicit arrangements <laughs> and helped mark the advent of sexual liberation for women. Getting sweaty and dancing with partners of the opposite sex became morally tricky, especially for women. Even more alarming, the critics believe that these new primitive sounds encourage racial mixing, a kind of musical miscegenation, staggering Jim Crow just a bit. 40, and then I talk about Elvis, 40 years later in Tupelo, Mississippi, and so on. So anyway, uh, that's how people, a lot of people, looked upon jazz when it first came to fore. And in Black Soldiers, another thing that's interesting, um, during the war, African-American soldiers were looked upon by the British as vulnerable to flipping sides because of the way they knew uh, uh, blacks were treated, particularly in the Jim Crow South. So they would, they placed flyers, or they actually dropped flyers from aircraft on units where African American soldiers were stationed. This is actually one of them that's been, that's, that's uh, now, well, they translated it, of course, before they dropped them, but uh, they thought that they would be very vulnerable to German propaganda. So I'm, you know, I'm not going to read the whole thing, and you can't see it probably from where you're sitting. But you know, uh, this was addressed to the African American soldier. Can you go into a restaurant where white people dine? Can you get a seat in the theater where white people sit? Can you get a Pullman seat or berth in a railroad car, or can you even ride in the same streetcar with white people? And how about the laws, lynching, and the most horrible cruelties connected with therewith? A law. 
they're with a lawful proceeding in a democratic country. Now, all of this is entirely different in Germany, where they do not, where they do like colored people, where they treat them as gentlemen and act as second and not as second-class citizens. So again, this was the appeal, hoping that it would convince some soldiers, black soldiers, to to come on their side. And there's no evidence that any of this ever worked, but there was this feeling among Americans too, not just the Germans, that they could they could turn on a don um, because they you know Southerners knew how they were treated. Uh, and this is just another flyer that was dropped, but it's, it goes on to defend the different, uh, the Germans say, the different lies about the way we treat American prisoners, and they're all lies. We actually treat them very well, it says. So they were defensive about this. In New Orleans, the epicenter of the Af African-American, middle-class African-American community was the Pythian Temple. And it's, on the right, it shows you what it looks like today. It's right on Loyola Avenue, right near Canal Street. And uh, on the left are some of the old photographs. This was where they would have African-American-owned businesses. There would be insurance agencies, uh, barber shops, uh, real estate agencies, and th stuff like that. And then they would have uh, even dances there on the top floor. There was a big a bank hall. But, but what the African-American community in New Orleans did, the, the middle class, more educated, black uh, citizen, they made an effort, an extreme effort during the war, to try to elevate themselves by being super supportive of the war effort. They were way, way beyond most other people. Uh, had fundraisers and dances and patriotic uh, events of various kinds. I sent letters to uh, the president, uh, making sure that, they, that he knew that they were 100% behind him. Because remember, I told you there was a division of uh, thought in the in the country, but what they what they were hoping to do was what they call uh, elevate themselves. What they called it uh, Negro uplift, Negro uplift. So if they were patriotic and followed in step with most of the rest of Americans who did follow and support the war, they too perhaps would rid themselves of the scourge of of Jim Crow. It did not happen, uh, but that was their effort. Black churches, particularly, were very supportive of the war. So uh, they wanted to make sure that you know blacks were as loyal as anyone else. Um, there were a couple of New Orleans uh, composers who even wrote uh, t uh, several songs, two of which became popular hits all over the country. And this is one of them here. And the man's name was Nickerson. And this was a really popular song, The Colored Soldier Boys of Uncle Sam, We're Coming. So uh, again, this idea of portraying themselves in a good light, patriotic spirit, even though they were menaced by Jim Crow. All right, another thing that I cover uh, in the book is the two big amendments uh, that were passed uh, during the war years and went into effect in 1920. One was the Prohibition Amendment. Now I know that seems like an oxymoron in New Orleans uh, and here too. I'm not gonna leave you guys out. Uh, but uh, the Prohibition Amendment uh, did get passed uh, in, the, in the state legislature in Baton Rouge. Uh, New Orleans were, was against it, but the state legislature was dominated by people from other parts of the state, rural areas and people that were much more uh, inclined to favor um, Jim Crow, not Jim Crow, uh, favor uh, dry uh, laws that would eliminate the uh, not the drinking, because drinking was not outlawed. The, it was the sale, the manufacture, and the transportation. That's what the amendment said. So uh, this was, I took this out of the, the Picayune again uh, in August the 9th, 1918, and I thought this was kind of funny. So it, the, the ratification resolution was adopted uh, by both houses in Baton Rouge, uh, the shouts of joy and noise over the dry victory continuing for more than a minute. When the demonstration ceased, Mr. Evans of Madison shouted, Now, Mr. Speaker, I move that the House take a recess in order to give the prohibitionists time in which to get tight and celebrate their victory. <laughs> so, 
So, and he, he was certainly right, because that's exactly what they did. They went up to some bar and they got drunk, I guess, because they had a victory. Uh, and of course, this brought on another demonstration that threw the house into an uproar. So, I just thought I'd show you that. And these are just some photographs uh, during the campaign in favor of the Prohibition Amendment. And then they, they were so clever. The, the, the Prohibitionists were very clever because what they did, folks, they linked the uh, support for the Prohibition Amendment to patriotism, to the war effort. So if you were against Prohibition, if you were a wet, it made you seem a little unsavory because you were not clearly patriotic. Why was that? Anybody? How, how did they make that connection? Anybody want to guess? Beer. Beer. Keep going. German beer. Exactly. Beer. You are correct, sir. That's right. Most breweries across the country, including the ones in New Orleans, there were 11, by the way, during the war, they were owned by German people. Uh, their names were uh, typically German, too. You think about the names of beers, very Germanic. And so, again, this is, you know, they called it uh, uh, the, the Kaiser's Brew. The Kaiser, of course, was the leader of Germany. So these are some posters that show you just what I'm saying here. So on the left, our three big enemies. So you've got the German on the left, you've got the Austrian in the center, and John Barleycorn, liquor, on the right. There are three big enemies. And then on the center, it says what alcohol does, and you can see this artillery piece that's made to look like a bottle of booze, and they were bombarding an American city. And then not in the peace treaty, you're still your enemy. So you can see booze. Can you see that in the far right? Booze is grabbing uh, American soldiers' leg there. Can you read that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, again, that, that, that's why it passed. It was so clever. Look at this. Um, the National German-American Alliance and its allies, pro-German brewers and liquor dealers. A disloyal combination. And then look, how can you resist the poster on the right? <laughs> Children, American flag, the men in uniform, vote dry for us. You can't vote against kids, right? And there's a couple of more. The saloon backer is a traitor to his country. And then on the right, will you back me or back booze? So it's one or the other. You can't be both, right? Vote yes for prohibition. So they, they did a good job of selling their position. The other amendment that was uh, conse consequential during those war years was finally the women's suffrage amendment. It's going to pass in 1920. You can go ahead and applaud. Go, <laughs> go right ahead. Um, long, long, hard journey here because this effort started back in the 18th, prior to the Civil War. Um, but it was passed. Um, and one of the reasons, as you could probably guess, was because of the great performance of women in New Orleans and elsewhere during the war, assuming jobs that were heretofore for men only. And in New Orleans, it was streetcar conductors. It was Oh, horrors, selling clothes in men's clothing stores. Now, yeah, that was unheard of. Being elevator operators. And w women never did that. I guess they thought, I don't know, I've thought about this. I wonder if, if it was because, you know, those old elevator gate, those doors that were like heavy metal gates that would fold up. I guess they thought it was too hard for them to open and close. I don't know. Uh, another thing that surprised me was ushers in theaters. That was all men, and that, of course, uh, changed during the war. So, they, you know, we all know about Rosie the Riveter, that famous iconic look of the woman uh, showing off her biceps in World War II, but there was a Rosie the Riveter in World War I as well. It's just that the war, we were only in this war 19 months from the declaration to the armistice. So the war didn't last that long. Actually, we're only in combat about six months. Uh, so it was even shorter. So um, that, and, and every one of those positions was done with great aplomb. They did a very good job. It was recognizable to anyone. They did things like drive cars, which you didn't see before the war. Uh, not only that, but in the, in the basement of the Roosevelt Hotel, that's still in New Orleans, right off of Canal Street. In the basement, they conducted uh, classes for auto mechanics, all women. 
and the instructor was a woman. So you could come in there and learn how to change the oil and fix the brakes. Uh, I mean, this was unheard of before. So they did these kinds of things. There was a unit of young women at Newcomb College that um, uh, got together a, a rifle uh, uh, squad. And they would go out and, not that they were ever going to use the rifle, but just again, to show their patriotism, they went out and took rifle practice every day using the, the same kind of Springfield that the troops did. So anyway, this helped to push over the amendment, um, not in Louisiana, however, I don't know about Mississippi, but we, we turned it down, but they had enough states, three-fourths of the states were necessary to approve the amendment, and so it was passed. And then this lady here, I'm not going to spend too much time on her, she was a native of the city of New Orleans, and her name was Gordon, Kate Gordon, and she and her sister were very vehemently uh, in favor of the so women's suffrage amendment. She was called a soft, they all called them soft's, uh, and she was a tremendous uh, ignition for a lot of improvements in the city. So it wasn't just the women's suffrage amendment, but things like homes for the, what they call at that time, the feeble-minded. I mean, I know that's a derisive term, but that's what they call them. Sanitation improvements in the city. Uh, she was responsible for getting Tulane Med School to accept its first woman uh, in the med school there. She actually went to Baton Rouge and demanded that, that the legislature also push for this. Child labor reform, she was big in this, but she was an unapologetic racist. So a lot of the things that she wanted, she wanted the right to vote, but she wanted the right to vote for white women, frankly, like a lot of other Southern suff suffragists. Nurses on Canal Street, of course, nurses participated as well. There were lots of different uh, events on Canal Street. There were five major fundraisers for the war so that people would be able to buy um, what they call at that time uh, uh, war bonds. Uh, and um, you know, New Orleans did a great job of this. Another big topic that I cover in the book, which is kind of scary, is Germanophobia. So you probably know this, and it probably is the same story throughout the country, but there was a terrible, um, uh, I guess, uh, it was a, a campaign, really, against German-Americans in the city. Uh, whether they were born in Germany or not, it didn't matter. If you had a Ger German last name, you were going to suffer in some way. And so here's a list of just a few of the businesses or churches that changed their names because of this anti-German hysteria that swept through New Orleans during the war. You can see here the Pickwick Club, which is really is a step, really highly uh, regarded men's club, expelled a member for refusing a loyalty oath. And then the, the Picayune carried the syndicated column by a guy named Robert Bowen. Look at what he says. I'll pull this out. German aliens are, quote, the scum of the melting pot, poisoning America. They are serpents in our bosom. So he didn't pull any punches. So the German people in the city were terrified. Um, I uh, interviewed one lady uh, that remembered that her, uh, either a grandmother or a great grandmother, I forget, but uh, they spoke German in the house. Uh, that's all they did, spoke German. And during the war, however, uh, she remembers them that they were not to speak German at all, except in a low whisper. They didn't want anyone out on the street to hear that German was being spoken in, this, in the city, uh, in, in this household. Uh, so it was really tough. Um, this is one of the things that helped to inflame this feeling. Look at this. This is the cover of Life magazine in 1915. Can you see some of the things, that, that the changes of it? So this is America's now New Prussia. Look at that. New Orleans is New Hamburg. Um, my favorite is Chicago. Chicago was renamed Slaughterhouse. <laughs> Appropriate for them, right? So anyway, so th this was the feeling, this is 1915, that the country was vulnerable to some kind of German uh, occupation. So it, it helped to encourage this hysteria that was directed toward the German population. Of course, these iconic 
posters did not hurt at all. Of course, they always referred to the German as a Hun, the barbarian from Germany. Um, on the right, typically, they, they would depict the German as some kind of beast-like character. Um, and, you know, oftentimes carrying an innocent woman away, uh, dressed in white to demonstrate innocence. Um, and then look at the blood on this guy's hands on the left there. These were enlistment posters. Remember Belgium, there's a girl again being taken away by a German soldier. Keep the hunt out, buy home protection with war savings stamps at which you could buy. Young children could afford to buy the stamps. Look at this. The Hun, his mark, blotted out with liberty bonds. And then just the simple picture of this beast-like character ripping apart the world, blooded, bloodily. No wonder we had this kind of feeling. And then there were movies. Uh, one of them, or oh, two of them here, the To Hell with the Kaiser. This was actually playing at the Tudor Theater on Canal Street, and they, uh, to advertise its, its uh, showing, the Tudor erected a scaffold uh, with uh, the, the um, Kaiser being hanged in effigy right there on the sidewalk on Canal Street. Uh, and that, I'm sure, brought people in. And then another one, the Kaiser, the Beast of Berlin, uh, shown all over the country. And then look at this. Remember the Cats and Jammer kids? Oh no, they can't have that. It's too German. So they, came, they became the Shenanigans kids, and the names of the characters went from Hans and Fritz to Mike and Alec. It's just crazy stuff, right? When, you have, when there's fear in your midst, people do some awful, awfully crazy things. I don't know if any of you know about Cobb's Restaurant on St. Charles Avenue. Oh, you do? Okay. So Cobb's was a very famous German restaurant. It's still there, although it's not a restaurant. It's just an unoccupied place, sadly. But this Cobb sign is still there. But anyway, uh, Conrad Cobb was a really well-known German leader in the city. Everybody knew him. And um, there were rumors that, that Germans had stored, uh, that he was allowing Germans to store bombs in his, in his uh, restaurant. So he actually had to make a public statement uh, and he said, when I took my, my oath of allegiance to the U.S., I meant it and I still do. So he had to defend himself and the, there was no evidence of any bomb in his, his restaurant at all. And he was always out there in public whenever there was a fundraiser for war bonds and things just to demonstrate his loyalty because he felt the heat. There's no doubt about it. And then I don't know if you know this or not, but um, there was a street, I say was, a street in New Orleans named Berlin Street. And of course, typically it has tiles missing. It's, we've got to remember, this is New Orleans. So, so they don't, they don't, they're not quick to repair things. But anyway, Berlin Street was a street in uptown New Orleans that ran parallel, for those of you who know uh, uptown New Orleans, uh, St. Charles, uh, uh, not St. Charles, Napoleon Avenue, and then uh, one other street, Berlin Street came next, ran parallel to Napoleon Avenue, Austerlitz Street, Marengo Street. Those were all streets, now get this, the streets were all named to um, honor Napoleon for his victories over the Germans. They were all Ger the French victories over the Germans in the Franco-Prussian War years before. Uh, so Berlin Street was not there to honor Berlin, it was there to honor Napoleon and the defeat of Germany. But yet, uh, you know, there are several people that came over and over again to the city council and they demanded to, to remove the name of Berlin Street. We cannot have a street named after the enemy's capital. And so it was removed. Does anybody know what street name they removed? No. <laughs> No, could have been though. Um, no, it's it, the same street, but the name was changed. It was General Pershing Street, and General Pershing was the name of the American commander of, of troops, American troops in France during the war. It's still, it's still General Pershing Street uh, today. So this was cultural genocide, huh? 
uh, basically, Germanophobia. Okay. Um, yeah, you know what? I, I'm going to skip back if you don't mind. I forgot to read this to you. This talking about the African American presence in France. So if you would allow me to skip back a bit, I'm sorry. Um, African American troops did contribute a lot to the formation of jazz in, in Europe, but uh, they also um, benefited a great deal from, from um, the French women uh, that were there. So I'm going to read this to you just a second here. So Lieutenant James McConnell, he was a New Orleans guy from uptown New Orleans um, in, the, in the National Guard, but he was in France. He was incredulous. In letters to his mother, the newlywed wrote repeatedly about contemporary Gallic or Gaelic sexual mores. And he writes, I am thoroughly disgusted with the French women, as they have absolutely no modesty and are not immoral, but simply unmoral, as they have no morals at all. <laughs> he related in an instance when he brought his unit of over 200 men for a swim in the ocean. Standing on a mound of sand nearby were 15 to 20 unblushing women and girls watching the naked men, laughing and enjoying the attention they received from the Americans. If they like a man, he's, it's all right to sleep with him whether he is married or not. I thank the Lord that I am married before, I married before coming over to this country. They could not understand why sex with them would be a problem since the soldiers' wives were so far away. Um, I spent most of my time last night telling Parisian beauties that I was married and I did not care to sleep with them. In another letter, he told how an, incident, uh, an innocent stroll down a Paris boulevard with another officer was interrupted by at least 15 times by young girls who wanted to take us to their rooms, and they were pretty and vivacious. McConnell explained flatly that they simply like American officers, uh, but he overlooked one item. Americans had money to spend. So there you go. And I meant to talk about the African-American soldiers, but that's about... Well, anyway, that's all right. This group also, I, I spent some time in the book about this. This is a surprising group that I did not know about even, except before I started researching. It was called, a group called the, the uh, uh, American Protective League. And this was their badge, and it looked very much like a Secret Service badge, uh, but it was the American Protective League. And... For one dollar, you could join the American Protective League and get this really fancy badge that would get you a lot of places, uh, free streetcar rides in the city, for example. But what happened was that the FBI at the time was called the Bureau of Investigation then. They had very few people, and they were worried about saboteurs, uh, espionage throughout the country when the war began. So they, uh, three men from Chicago... Uh, went to uh, the Attorney General of the United States and said, look, we'll, let's start this volunteer organization. We can go out and we can help you pinpoint or identify anyone that might seem to be disloyal. And so that's how it got started. There were 2,000 in New Orleans at various times. And all over the country, they had these APL agents. And this is one of their newsletters here. Um, and to enter, I, this is actually... Uh, a, uh, uh, the print, a, a copy of one of their applications to belong. And I don't know if you can read or not, but it's very simple. It took you three minutes to fill it out. Uh, you know, your residence, your, your business phone, residence phone, are you married, what organizations are you affiliated with, do you have any military uh, experience, do you speak any foreign languages, and then it asks you what your business was. And that's it. You signed it, sent a dollar in, and you became a member of the American Protective League. Well, things went bad, as you might guess, because they were not supposed to have arresting power. They were not supposed to be able to carry a weapon. Both of them were vi both of those rules were violated. Um, and what they did was they didn't really find anyone in the way of espionage activities, anything in the way of espionage activities, but they did turn to other so-called threats to America. Um, anyone that seemed in any way to be suspiciously pro-German could be uh, brought in for questioning. Um, and they would arrest those people and bring them into the office and then the, their leader would uh, question them. So you, it's, this is kind of blurry, but this is an actual copy of a report 
that was sent by one of the APL agents to his superior. And they arrested this man on a train, uh, in a train car, and he was saying um, that he overheard him saying that Germany had, oh, and this is not the train car, the next one is. I can't remember where he was brought in, but where it's important what he said. Germany had given the world so much. It's literature, science, philosophy, music. He called Germany the greatest race in the world, or Germans the greatest race in the world. This was at a tea at the Palace Hotel. By saying just that, he was brought in for question because he was admiring uh, Germany. And this is another one here. Uh, this was the person that was in a train car and he refused to pay for his order because he was refused a second allowance of sugar, which was rationed at the time. So he became abusive and made several nasty remarks about the food restrictions. So he was criticizing the rationing that the government had imposed. He was arrested and brought in for questioning. And I don't know what happened to him, but this is the kind of thing that took place by these people who were basically vigilantes, government-sponsored vigilantes, because they worked under, directly under the Attorney General of the United States. So it's kind of scary to have these people around doing these things that they were not supposed to be doing. But they did it. And you can see I have a list of some of the other things that they did. Participated in raids on homes, engaged in blatantly illegal searches. They didn't have search warrants. They just walked into a person's home or office. Opened safes, went through desk drawers. Uh, documents were photographed. And then, of course, when pressure was brought to the foot of uh, the Attorney General, his name was Gregory, he excused these illegalities. He said, I'm convinced that zealous members were led into this breach of authority by the excessive of zeal for the public good. So we can forgive all of these civil liberties uh, violations because it's for the public good. That's how he defended that. So anyway, it was uh, pervasive throughout, uh, throughout the country. In New Orleans, I have a list in my book in one of the appendices that shows you all the different arrests that were made under which category. It's pretty scary. German language. Attack on the German language was all over the country. In New Orleans, uh, in particular, it affected our schools and even Tulane University. Um, you know, the, I, I think there's nothing more important to a, a culture than its language. You lose your language, you've lost the basis of your culture. And so when this attack came on the German language, it was the beginning, I think, of the end of German uh, culture in, in Louisiana and throughout the country. Um, there was, to give you an example of how crazy it was, there was a fourth grade English book, textbook, that was in all the public schools in New Orleans. And they had a photograph of this newly built uh, elementary school in Germany. And the caption read, so I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like, you know, uh, this is a brand new school, wouldn't it be nice to have, to have your classes in this brand new building? something really um, congratulatory about the German, German people and the German uh, educational system. That book was banned. They took the, that English textbook was taken out of all the public schools in New Orleans because of that photograph. So, um, and then in the, this is a Picayune cartoon. This, I don't have to explain this, it's self-explanatory. Now, um, I skipped another thing in here, too. At Tulane, this is what happened there. Several professors, well, the entire faculty was told that they had to sign a loyalty oath to the United States or else they would be relieved of their, of their teaching responsibilities. And not everybody signed it. They objected to the idea that we had to sign an oath. So this one professor, he was a biology teacher, his name was Bayer, uh, Professor Baer's case was especially tragic. He wrote a letter to the board begging it to reconsider, given his long service to the university and his unswerving loyalty to the United States. A 37-year resident of the United States and a naturalized U.S. citizen, Baer, born, German-born, admitted making statements before U.S. entry into the war that might seem disloyal to some, but they assumed a meaning and significance unintended. 
Since he was never informed about what those statements were, however, he could not properly defend himself. He wrote that he had never been a member of any Germanic society, was married to an American who worked for the Red Cross, had a brother-in-law serving in France, and was a proud Liberty Bond holder. The, uh, a, the, um, where are we? the aspirations and ambitions and interests uh, are all completely American, he wrote. The professor closed by dig digging deep. He wrote this to the Board of Supervisors at Tulane. He says, I am now 56 years old, 26 years of the prime of my life has been lived in loyal, devoted, and unremitting service to Tulane University. My happiness and my life have been my work at Tulane. Today, that has been blotted out. He implored the board for the simple opportunity, listen to this, to appear before it in order to make his case. After a, quote, a lengthy discussion, unquote, at the July board meeting, a motion was made and seconded for Bear's letter to be received and recorded in the minutes without action. The voice vote on the motion, again, passed almost unanimously except for one. Uh, so you, you almost unanimously voted that he should not be given a chance to defend himself, and he was relieved from his position. So uh, I found that in the minutes to uh, Tulane's Board of Supervisors. It's pretty sad there. And he was not the only one. There were other stories as well. Um, so anyhow, um, so this is what the oath essentially says, very short. Uh, you state your country of origin, and then to, uh, you promise to uphold the government of the United States and its persecution, pro prosecution of the war against Germany and its allies. The mayor of New Orleans at this time was a guy named Martin Berman. He was a 16-year mayor of New Orleans, longer than anyone else had ever served, and he was a great leader during the war. He was indefatigable. He went from one public event to another, you couldn't stop him. And on his, uh, his desk, uh, there was a sign that said, don't park here, which meant hurry up, say what you need to say, I got things to do. So don't sit there and linger. Um, I have some pictures here of some of the, I don't think it's something that you would need, need to see, but it's about some of the amusement parks that the soldiers stationed in New Orleans went to. It's a place called Milneyburg, where essentially, um, Pontchartrain Beach was, another place called Spanish Fort. It was very well developed along the south shore of Lake Pontchartrain, but most of these places were destroyed by storms and hurricanes. But they had Ferris wheels, alligator parks, they had lots of different activities, including a hotel and dance uh, facilities for people. Every weekend they would have people out there dancing. It was quite a place uh, to go. So uh, I told you about all these different fundraisers on Canal Street. The city raised 103 million, over 103.2 million uh, dollars, and that's 1918 money uh, during these fundraisers. They would they would go all out to get people to come out and just experience, you know, the euphoria for these fundraisers. They would have planes, spy planes, you know, those old World War One planes and they would swoop down pretty close to the people on the streets and drop uh, bags of flour that would mimic uh, bombs that would be dropped on the people, explode on them. And everybody came out to see that because to see a plane uh, was not that commonplace and to see one come down so low. Uh, and they had even things like tanks come down Canal Street. Um, anyway, that's a British tank. And this is a, a facility um, that Tulane University students use. That's the fairgrounds in New Orleans, and they use that to help train what came to be the uh, ROTC. And then there's Storyville. I don't, I'm, about, I'm out of time, I can see, right? So I'm going to talk briefly about Storyville, which was the legalized prostitution area in New Orleans. And this map shows you where Storyville was. Some of you may know. Here's Canal Street down here. Uh, but anyway, Storyville was a 20 square block area where uh, prostitution was legal um, and uh, you go right down the street to the left of the Southern Railroad uh, terminal, that's where you'd find Storyville. All those buildings are now torn down. These are on the right some of the more upscale brothels that were there. But it was a racially heterogeneous uh, offering. There's one that remains? 
So they were called women notoriously abandoned to lewdness. That was the official <laughs> government uh, way of designating who these women were. But it was the interesting thing was that it was racially heterogeneous. So Jim Crow was not in effect during uh, the days of Storyville. And the, the, the Army, uh, the Navy, actually shut it down because they didn't want their men uh, acquiring any kind of uh, diseases. So on, the mayor tried his best to keep it in operation, but it didn't happen. <laughs> and then finally, the, 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 the first monument to, uh, to the men uh, that served in World War I uh, was erected right here in New Orleans uh, in the Ninth Ward. And it's still uh, there, although it's in a, in a kind of an obscure place. Anyway, that is it, folks. And uh, the most important slide is this one. This is, <laughs> this is what my book looks like right here. And if you're interested, it is for sale. I'll be happy to sign it for you. It's $28. According, that's not my price. That's the University of Mississippi's <laughs> press. So if you're interested, thank you so much for your attention. And I'm sorry I went overboard there a little bit. Okay, thank you.